Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Pedophile Huntress. Tonight is a very special podcast for me. Um, I have a special guest. His name is Russell Stagg. He's written a remarkable book. Um, I've read most of it. It's called One in Six, and it's a guide actually for men who have been sexually abused. So much of everything that's out here is for women, and I'm just so excited to have him here with me. I'll have all of his uh, credentials, his books, and his book and that sort of thing in the comments. Um, so if you want those things as we get done and as we move forward, I'll make sure that we have that all here. Um, I'm going to start with Russell. And Russell, I'm going to let you just go ahead and introduce yourself. And um, there's many things. Your book has so many so many things that validate men. I'm just so proud and honored that you took the time to be here tonight and to discuss this with us. But if you'd start with why you wrote this book, what you do for a living, um, and just kind of introduce yourself to the listeners. Okay. Well, thank you, Jody. And first of all, thank you for having me on the show. So uh, my name is Russell Stagg. I'm a psychotherapist in St. John, New Brunswick, Canada. Um, I'm licensed in three provinces. Uh, I'm a psychotherapist, and I'm also a survivor of child sexual abuse. Um, my work on trauma has been published in major uh, psychology journals, and my research has been cited uh, 4,000 times. It's remarkable. <laughs> I, I love it so much. Um, were you finished, or were you... Uh, well, um, I can, I can start talking about my book. Uh, if well, like. one of the things, you know, I'd like to actually start, I, I, there, there were so many remarkable things, Russell, honestly, that I want to talk to you about, but I really want to start your story with this one. It's, it's in your book and it's on page 17. And you say along the way, there were many serious challenges, but the evening of April 24th, 1990 was my turning point. The day my recovery journey started, the moment my life changed forever. Can you bring us into your life at 1990 and tell us what was going on, what was happening, and what made this 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 pivotal moment in your life? Wow. Okay. So, um, yeah, at, at that point in my life, um, I was underemployed. Uh, my marriage was falling apart. Uh I just couldn't connect with people. I had tremendous social anxiety. Um, and I knew something was seriously wrong. I didn't really understand what it was, but I knew something was wrong. And uh, one day I was uh, just in a shopping mall. I passed a bookstore, I went in. And for some reason, I picked up a book called Adult Children of Abusive Parents. And I felt tremendously guilty <laughs> picking that book up. Um, and so I bought it, I took it home, I hid it in a sock drawer. And three days later, uh, I, I took it out one evening when I was alone and I started reading it and I just got to the, uh, the first line, like you, I was abused as a child. I totally lost it. I just lost it. Um, like I was finally admitting to myself that I had been abused. Um, and I, I was curled up on the floor. I was just sobbing. I sobbed all night. I, I, I cried for months <clears throat> and I got into therapy. I got into uh, 12 step programs and, uh, but it, it was as if uh, uh, all that emotion had been uh, dammed up yeah. and in an instant the dam broke and there i was just crying and crying for my lost childhood and isn't it remarkable that the words like you 
I was abused. You write quite a bit about the emotions and why we don't remember. Um, you know, I, I hear this all the time. I, I always tell people, if you think you've been abused, you have been abused because people just don't say, oh, I think I've been <laughs> abused. But, you know, it's funny how many people say, you know, I kind of think there was something because, you know, our fragmented memories come through often. Oh, so yes. talk a little bit about, so here you are, you're married. I don't know if you have children at the time, but in your book, you talk about your drinking, you know, I don't know how much, but clearly we all love to drink because it blocks our memories. It stops our mind, our emotions. So it's 1990, you read these words and you know, it's like somebody doesn't ask us the right question, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, the, at, at that point, I guess I knew <clears throat> that I had been abused and that was about it. Um, I, I couldn't put any kind of a, of a face to that. Um, but I, I had always remembered, um, being, when I was alone with my mother as a child, she was naked <laughs> and that was kind of strange. And, <clears throat> um, I had memories of helping her to take her stockings off and you know helping her take a bath and things like that and i guess as i began to sort of accept that i had been abused i i started to fill those memories out mm -hmm. um i had always had this really strange uh emotional reaction when i saw people wearing nylon clothing it's like wow it just it's it seemed incredibly erotic to me and it it dawned on me <clears throat> i don't quite know how <clears throat> that that was actually a memory right i was remembering my mother's nylon panties mm -hmm. that I... she had made me take off Right. They're um, triggers. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's it, fascinating it, how they work. Yeah. It, that was a trigger. And I, it, but mm -hmm. I couldn't place what it was. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it's like, oh, my gosh, now I remember. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it wasn't, gee, I wonder what it might have been. It's like, oh, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Um, That memory led to another that my mother had made me take my clothes off and get in bed with her. And then it led to another memory of her pushing my head down under the covers. So it was, it was interesting. It was just one memory after mm -hmm. another. And the, the trigger had been this really strange emotional reaction to nylon clothing. And what do you think precipitated you to allow, was it that book that you read that you finally said to your mind and your heart, I'm going to allow these memories? I find, you know, I talk to a lot of victims and as they move through life and they're 20, 30 years down the road, which is often when many of us recover these memories, there has to be this triggering event where we say we're going to allow it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The turning point. The turning point. And so the that moment the, your life changes. Yeah. You know, and it, I love that you say it like that because when I was in a very abusive marriage and my children were little, I didn't have memories either. Although I had those fragments that would come through mm -hmm. all the time. I yeah. knew something had happened in this motel room. You know, you, we have these fragments, but we don't give any time. We, we give time to only deny them and push them back down. <laughs> Right. And so I think it's yeah. interesting that you say one memory opens another memory, opens another memory. And it's very true because we can have this fragment of a memory that we've given no emotion to. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's something happens. I think it's almost to give yourself permission mm -hmm. to think wait a minute, maybe that memory has something to do with 
Well, in that case, it was with my mother. Exactly. And then as I realized, it fitted in with that scene mm -hmm. it, with my mother in the bedroom helping me take her stockings off. It's like, oh, there it right. is. Right. I, and I love that because you talk about that children can actually have a sexual arousal and being groomed correctly they there they should make us you know unless you're so little that there's just it's painful because that was my experience but they can definitely arouse you i've heard many people say that that you know um you're aroused because we're sexual uh -huh. beings right yeah. and yeah. so that that delivers a lot of shame and it's hard to bring then those emotions back to that scene because if we keep the emotions away it can just be this weird story somewhere that's in a shelf on a closet in the back room, right? But when you take uh -huh. those memories down and then you feel those, it opens up all the emotions. And I loved when you wrote about, I'm not looking for the story as much as I am the emotions in my patients. Talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that. I thought I've never really heard anybody put it in that term because mostly people, right, are trying to get away from emotions or coming through abuse and pain. We put our emotions in a tool ba belt only to be taking out when we need them, you know, that kind of thing. I thought that was fascinating that you said that to get to your emotions. Talk a little bit about that. Okay. So uh, uh, as a therapist, um, uh, you know, a client will be talking about something and all of a sudden I notice an emotion and it's like, whoa, we, we have to grab that because you can you can tell yourself all kinds of things. You can lie to yourself, but your emotions don't lie. And somehow or other, something they just said caused a realization that they had reached the truth. It's, there was something very important there. Exactly. I love that. It's it's very true. And and I think a lot of times people can deny what they think that they're seeing, but you mm -hmm. cannot deny the emotion tied to it, right? Like I've yeah. gone through some really um, strange experiences in my life. I love the book now that we all know the body keeps the score. There was this time in my life when I started, both of my arms had this cr this strange aching and, you know, I, I was in counseling for years and years and years, but um, I couldn't figure it out. I went to see this physical therapist and he said, well, Jody, actually your arms wouldn't hurt in the area you say they're hurting. In the middle of the night, Russell, I woke up and I saw that my mother was straddling over me and I was very small. I was not, I turned four in the big house. So I was probably three mm -hmm. wow. and there it was. And, you know, as soon as I got that memory back, my arms, the, the next day they were fine. It was so weird. And they hurt for six or seven months. I mean, I don't even, I can't even tell you how long it was very strange. And I also had an experience come back in my body where my ankle hurt this one time when my father was raping me as a child, he had held my leg in such a way that really probably sprained my ankle and my ankle hurt forever until that memory came out. So these memories are very, they need our, they need our body's experience with them. Right. And I, and I think mm -hmm. that's what yeah. the emotion is, is, it's our body's experience with it. The mind cannot house everything, right? Yeah. And the, we the body remembers. <laughs> the body remembers. I think that's yeah. so beautiful. It's it's really true. And you said another thing I thought, um, I'd never really heard it this way, um, but you talked about during the grooming process, you said on page nine, child molesters make you think you have a choice. Uh -huh. Th that that's yeah. there's such wisdom in those words because I've talked to people that are my friends. I've talked to people, you know, out doing this work. And you know what they say? Oh, well, I had a choice, but I wasn't getting love at home. She was nine years old. And this is really uh -huh. what yeah. this woman believed. So talk a little bit about that. I think there's a lot of wisdom that people get stuck in the tragedy of they're complicit in the crime. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, this is something I've struggled with too. That <clears throat> I I really have to, you know, I'm a therapist now, so I can think clearly. But I look at what happened to me, and I really have to struggle to be objective and tell myself, "Wait a minute, you really did not have a choice there." Exactly. 
you couldn't have done anything else given your situation and your age. But it's it's really hard to do. It's incredibly hard. And I noticed that people, they abusers are so good at making that complicity that that we're part of this act. And it, it's it's fascinating to me. And I think that people often don't step back into their memories because of that guilt. It's like, we're feeling the guilt of the perpetrator. You know what I mean? Like I watched my father mm -hmm. murder oh, this yeah. woman and for years I'd say we killed her. And my counselor would say, Jody, you've got to stop saying we, but I yeah. turned four after that murder. And so everything in me believed we had done that. We left the room alive. We cleaned up the room. We went and buried her. It's the same yeah. thing with with any childhood crime that that we witness, right? We're, we're, we're child witnesses to these things, but we don't call them crimes, do we? We call them, no, I don't no. know, we call them family nuances or, you know, it's it's odd to me that people don't call incest a crime. It's a crime. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> it's, it's a crime. And so if we get to this place where we can delineate that these are not family matters, these are crimes that are occurring and, to heal people and, and, and speak the truth and that sort of thing. I'm curious because, um, on my YouTube channel, I put, uh, up, um, asking people what they'd like me to talk about. And somebody said family, the complications around family relationships. So I'd like to talk to you about that for just a minute about the, it's your mother, right? And so now it's uh -huh. 1990, you're going to go back into this memory, do you believe you have to confront? I haven't read, I didn't read that in your book that, you know, about going back to your mother. Talk a little bit about that relationship and what did healing look like there for you? Okay. So the the first thing I did was, no, I did not confront my mother. Well, I kind of did. I, I, I just wrote her a letter and said, <clears throat> I, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to... Uh, correspond with you. I'm not going to have anything to do with you ever again. And she died, oh, I guess, what, seven years later. Um, I didn't go to her funeral. You didn't. So and you guys did I not had... discuss this then? No. And, um, you know, with with my clients, they they really struggle mm -hmm. to separate themselves with family. They do. I, I mean, I've and, seen many people. Yeah, and and I in, encourage them to to just do it. Mm -hmm. Like, don't worry about confronting them because what will they do? They will try to make you doubt your memories. They'll try to make mm -hmm. you think you're crazy. They are not going to change their ways. If they give an apology, can you really believe it? And so on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I just decided, okay, I'm, I'm cutting, cutting loose. And I still think it was the right thing to do. I, you know, I, yep. I haven't regretted that. You know, I have to tell you, I think the same thing is true. It's, it's, it's a trigger to be around them. What people don't understand is you know, to be around my father or, you know, my father abused me from being little, tiny to I left his home, you know, and then it turned into sodomy because then I wouldn't be pregnant. And, you know, my mother actually was in those rooms, you know, she sometimes would read a book like it's, it's, it's such strange things, but to go back, it's, it's their triggers all around you. You have to leave mm -hmm. who you are and who you're trying to become outside the door. So I think there's a lot of wisdom in telling your clients to stay away. But I notice I'm, I'm hard pressed to understand why people have such a hard time making the separation. What do you think that is? Do you think it's the grooming, the trauma bonding with their parents? The What do you think? I, I think that abusers are really good at making their victims feel guilty. Mm -hmm. It's part of what they do. So, you know, people have told me, well, if I cut her off or him off, I'll, I'll feel so guilty. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's hard to convince them that, wait a minute, they're, they're adults. They can look after themselves. It's really important for you to look after yourself. And, you know, we were, we were raised to always uh, be thinking about 
other people, including the abusers. So uh, we feel guilty when we do something that's going to upset them. Mm -hmm. It's so true. You stated it perfectly, but that's very hard for people to see themselves. I always say you see you take your eyes off the abuser because when your eyes are on the abuser, right, then you're just looking at their life. You're looking at their guilt. You're, you know, all of these things. And I think people um, want this apology. And the truth is, well, an apology might be good. My father apologized for the murder on his deathbed. I still had a lot of healing to do that didn't, you know what I mean? It doesn't take you to this yeah. place of euphoria where, woo, I'm all done now. And, you know, I mean, I really, it, it, I was to, to translate that into my life. It really didn't affect my life that much. It was great to hear. I'm sorry, but maybe that was because he was just dying. You know what I mean? He never mm -hmm. said he loved yeah. me because love doesn't live with these people. I agree yeah. with you that um, there is a statistic. I don't have it with me right now, but they are one of one of the lowest number of rehabilitated people there are. Yeah. And I think it's because they're just so broken to ever, especially your own child. Incest to me is one of the worst crimes, I think, that are perpetrated against children because it's such a violation of everything good mm -hmm. and reasonable, yeah. right? And in and one of your patients in your books actually said, I knew, or was this you? I can't remember. I knew it wasn't love. When my mother was doing this to me, I knew it wasn't love. Yeah, I thought that, that I think, yeah. but that, I think that it, it struck me because, you know, I knew that too, but when people become adults, Russell, they change it to modify it, to say that it was love. Mm -hmm. Have you experienced that at all? Where I thought that I, I knew that my parents didn't have love for me either. And yet my father intricately wove this design in me that I would believe he loved me. But in my heart, I always knew he didn't because love wouldn't act like that, right? So mm -hmm. I, I determined I'm I'm just going to look for kindness in life because kindness is different than love, right? Because love was very complicated. So why did you know as a child that when I read that, it just struck me that children have a wisdom that we don't build on, right? And how come you knew that as a child that it wasn't love? I, I think we had pets. So, you know, I, I loved our pets. And so it, it, what I felt with my mother was, it, it was, I guess, a, a disgust, really, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that what she was making me do, that um, it, it did not feel right and it, it did not feel loving. So, you know, the, the baseline I had was, you know, the love between a, a child and a pet. Got you. So outside of uh, that, your grooming with your mother, she didn't build that kind of loving relationship outside of those, you know, uh, sexual acts? No, no, absolutely not. It was, oh, okay. uh, and, and I think with, with boys, it's often different that they're they're that they they don't get that kind of you know trying to build some kind of relationship. It's in in my mother's case, it was just control. Oh, interesting. And so they and I I've always wondered about this. My mother gave me much more rejection than my father did, and I always wondered if it was because the side of me made her remember who she was. You know, I couldn't help but think that my father had no problem with it at all. But it's a very unnatural act when it's your mother, right? And my mother made me do things that, you know, similar to what you've said about your mom. And I always wondered if it was hard for her or something. I don't know. She rejected me a lot. I never got anything from my mother. She was always very far away from me. And so that's interesting. It could be because mother perpetrators act differently. What's your opinion on that? It, that's curious to me. I've never thought of it in that way until you said it. Yeah, I, I know with, with my mother, she uh, really went out of her way to, to make, to put me down, <clears throat> to uh, criticize me. Um, she would set me tasks that were way beyond my abilities. And then she'd criticize me for being stupid and, and clumsy and, you know, whatever. Uh, it, it was, it was pretty much constant. And, uh, that, that was part of the abuse too. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, a hundred percent. That, that, that sounds very much like my mother. Yeah. There is not a lot of kindness in this. One of the things I really liked about your book was how much you talk about the statistics that are wrong. And one of the things that you said was in 1988, the courage to heal came out and me and my girls, both, I married an abuser, unfortunately. And so I had the task of trying to help my children with the right tools to heal from that as well. So the courage to heal, they actually called it a Bible. We had it laying around our house. Mm -hmm. But one of the things you noted that I had never even thought about Russell was this is a book that talks about women. It was designed for women it's built for women. It has nothing to do with men. Although your numbers are quite clear, <laughs> there is there are millions. And if we do the real numbers, right, one in nine don't even report. So of those that report, that's 64 million survivors, but we know men are not coming forward like they should. So mm-hmm. that number is even less. So talk a little bit. I loved all the stats in your book because these, there's a clarity that you bring around how many men survivors there are. Just chat about that for a little bit, if you would, because you're going to do a much better job than I could. Okay. So the statistics are stunning and they are stunning. People have trouble with them. They refuse to believe them. And I say, look, I'm taking numbers from the largest scale, most reputable surveys ever carried out. You don't like these numbers, take it up with the CDC, take it up with the uh, National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, take it up with these uh, renowned uh, authors of these large-scale studies. I'm just the messenger here. But for instance, one statistic that I pointed out is somewhere between 43 and 48 percent of sexual violence is perpetrated against males. Um, I I point out that basically males are uh, experience sexual violence at almost the same rate that females do, that at least 40 percent of child sexual abuse is perpetrated against males. And it's probably higher than that. Um, I point out that most sexual violence toward males is perpetrated by females. Mm-hmm. And that is something people will try to argue with me about. And I just say, look, don't argue with me. Argue with them. Argue with those authors who did those massive mm-hmm. surveys with tens of yeah. thousands of people. You know, argue with them. Don't argue with me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I also point out that roughly a third of sexual abuse of boys is perpetrated by mothers. Yeah. So mother son incest is the most common kind of sexual abuse of boys. Um, of the male clients, I've had hundreds of them. I had, I think, one who was abused by a coach, one who was abused by a priest. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's what people think. They think, you know, th- that it's these sort of institutional abusers. They get all oppressed because you get lawsuits with lots of money with those right. kinds of people. But the, in actual fact, uh, most or, you know, probably at least half of, uh, of sexual abuse happens in the family. That's exactly right. I I loved that. I think that you're spot on. I talk to people all the time. There is so much mother incest and female, you know, uh, criminal sexual abuse that goes on. It's it's phenomenal. But I think it's far easier for society at large to listen to. It's outside of the home. It's down the street. It's the neighbor. For some reason, incest has carried such a taboo. I think it's one of the darkest, darkest things on this earth. It starts destroying people from childhood and it carries that through to the very end of their life. It's like a perfect crime of hell, but people don't want to look at it. You're right. And so I really honor your statistics. I went through those and 
I wasn't alarmed. Actually, I thought this is the truth because it. Yeah. It's, well, it's, you talk to these people. Yeah, I talked to <laughs> so them, and know. so I knew yeah. this was the yeah. truth. Right. Yeah. I knew it was the truth. You also talked about a statistic about prison rapes. I loved mm -hmm. what you brought up because, again, we have it all wrong in our mind. We think it's man on man. So talk about yeah. that statistic because I, I don't want to say it wrong. I don't have that in front of me. Uh, okay. Go ahead and share that because I, I thought in that, again, we have it wrong in our minds. Yeah, it was the, uh, now I, I hope I get it right, the National Bureau of Justice Statistics, I think it was, in the United States. Mm -hmm published this lengthy report of, mm -hmm. and I think it was like tens of thousands of uh, uh, inmates. Uh, they were looking at adolescent inmates, I think. Um, but they found that 84% of wow. sexual violence against male inmates was perpetrated by female guards. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, I, I just think that society, it's easier for them to comprehend that. They, you know what I mean? It's it's the Madonna uh, syndrome, or I don't even know, but it's it's fascinating to me when you start talking to people and you get them to tell their stories, your numbers are right. I know they're right. But the mm -hmm. problem is, is that men have not talked about these. And we have so many men and women who are destroying themselves because it's like what you said, if we don't allow our stories out, we're living at half mast at best. We're probably living with a quarter of, you know what I mean? Like you just cannot live because I, I read this book years ago and it, it would talked about the congruency between the left and the right hemisphere in our brains. And they took these, this group of people and they said, tell me a secret. And one of the things that you've never shared with anybody, and immediately there was a congruency between the two halves of the brain. And this book was fantastic, but what it said was you're using actually part of your mind to suppress and hide these memories. And so yeah. we're constantly depressed. We're constantly don't know who we are, right? We're not living our authentic self because we're living this made up version of what we've done to carry on. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh boy, uh, I'm sure that's true. Um, I, you know, I would have to, I think, uh, refer to my life. Um, that I, I think when we're doing that, sometimes the emotions come out, and when they come out, it's like that's that's the breakthrough we need, and. Um, I, I think in my book, I talked about how there was, uh, uh, my mother was, uh, she involved me in, in a group that was creating child porn. It, right. it was in a small town in England. It, it's, it, uh, uh, and I, you know, I've talked to people about it and they, they said, yeah, we, we actually see a lot of this kind of thing. But um, it, when the memory started coming back, they, they really didn't make much sense at first. Mm -hmm. And um, it was an experience many years after the first memory started coming up. I was in a hotel room and I was watching, a, a, it was, you know, just a crime drama on TV this made up stuff. And, and at the end of it, they were leading the hostages to safety. And there was a woman police officer leading a little girl. And I just lost it. Mm -hmm. That was a memory. That was a memory that in this, this group that was whatever making child pornography, there was a girl there. And I hadn't been able to rescue her. And those are huge. I wrote, I, I, when I read that in the book, it struck me as well, because often the lack of justice in these crimes, we don't know what justice is. I, I did a podcast once where I had some women on and it, it still breaks my heart. It brings tears to my eyes. And I asked them, what does justice look like for you? Do you know, Russell, there was just silence. Oh. And I, I understood it so well that 
we move on in life without justice, right? That lady that my dad yeah. murdered is still up there on his property. Well, they believe me, they need a confession. My father's gone now. But what about all these crimes that happen to children, right? We are witnesses. We are the evidence. But then we grow up and we don't say anything. Nobody's there to help us. And what does justice look like? When I read that, I, I so related to it because often people don't understand when we see these kinds of films and there's this great justice at the end, <laughs> our <Yeah>. hearts <laughs> want to explode with grief, yeah. right? And you talk yeah. about those stages and there's so much grief around the lack of justice that we've received, right? They honestly, and you know, then all, all of a sudden after awkward silence, they started saying things like, well, I guess living a good life. I mean, honestly, that was the only way that they could articulate what justice looked like. So that's a that's a profound emotion, a lack of justice, right? And then again, that guilt for not supporting her. I know that um, siblings often feel this. I've talked to many of them that come from homes of incest and they couldn't protect their siblings. My older sister came to me and apologized for that. She said, I didn't know what was dad was doing. Well, she couldn't do anything because again, these perps yeah. that make us believe that we have some kind of power here. We have no kind of power, right? Mm -hmm. We right. don't, but, but again, those triggers are happening all the time. And I think wisely, like you just shared, we need to move into those and allow those right to come out with us because I think it's, it's so true. One of the things that you talked about too, in your book, I thought was so well done because again, people can study us Russell, but if they haven't lived it, they can't understand it. And your distinction between PTSD and anxiety, I thought was so good. I want you to talk about that. I had to pick and choose the things because I could talk to you for hours because you just uh -huh. articulate it so well because I had a counselor that I adored and I was with him for well over 15 years and he changed my life profoundly. And I would tell anybody, get in good counseling because when flashbacks would come, I thought it was this woman's spirit coming to me and he yeah. helped me understand what a flashback was. Tell me where you saw her, Jody. PTSD is not anxiety. It can feel like right. anxiety, but it isn't. And I really want you to share with the listener because so many people I know don't go to counseling. They just hide in their rooms. They won't even follow our shows because they're too shameful, but they'll listen to them. So I want you to talk about and articulate as a survivor the difference between PTSD and anxiety. I thought you did such a beautiful job. Okay, so in my book, I started out with, uh, you know, the sort of thing that I would deal with in therapy. This uh, guy was in a car accident. And as a result, he was absolutely terrified to get behind the wheel. Um, you know, he's, he, his, he'd just be perspiring and shaking. His, his wife would have to take his hands off the wheel when <clears throat> they arrived at their destination. Uh, he, he took safe driving classes. He watched videos about, you know, how to be safe. He bought the safest car he could. And he, you know, he's talking to me about, you know, what a mess his life was. And he said, do you think I have PTSD? And the answer was no. And, you you know, some people might say, but look, this, this guy was just, he'd been in an accident, he had trauma. He was just a total mess. But everything he did was focused on the present or on the future. What might happen? That is not PTSD. That's anxiety. PTSD is focused on the past. And so then the second anecdote I gave was about um, a, a young man who'd gone to university. Um, he, he came from a, a ranch and, you know, he didn't interact much with anybody. He took uh, classes online. And so it, it was pretty uh, daunting for him to be in the big city. And he went to visit his aunt, who was, uh, it was his, uh, father's younger sister who was you know she was much younger uh, she was paying for his university education and so she showed up uh, in a I guess it was a nighty or something and applying him with alcohol and she she took it off and then told him well if, you know if you want the checks to keep coming you know you're going to have to please me and he was a total mess. He would hear 
a voice that sounded like her and he'd just have to get away. Um, he, he would see a face like hers and he would just freeze. Um, everywhere there seemed to be reminders. Everything would trigger these reactions in him um, that, that would feel like anxiety, but he was actually reliving something that had already happened. Um, so that's what PTSD is. It's it's a time machine that takes you back to the past. I I love that distinction because today I hear so many people interchange PTSD and anxiety, and mm -hmm. it's it's uh, it's sad because people that live with PTSD it's a very different thing. Anxiety can be very strong, and I'm so sorry for the listener that deals with that. But I loved the distinction that you made. And you talked about, you know, it really is reliving and going back into the past. And you gave some clarity around what you could do. There's been times in my life where, um, because the murder was so strong, I mean, ev everything, I am not undermining at all sexual trauma because I lived much of that myself in childhood. But I, I watched this movie one time and this woman's throat got slit in the movie and that my father had Ooh. done that to this woman and I froze. It's a very hard thing when you're there because you talked about you're there. You, like, you talked about some yeah. of your PTSD. It, this is not like I'm feeling anxiety about going back to that memory. You're <laughs> actually transported, like you said, in a time machine. Yeah. You are yeah. there. And I was frozen up against that wall as a child. And so I, I'd like you to just tell the listener what you can do in those moments because you had some really cool things in there that I hadn't thought about. I actually had my daughter happen to be there that night with me and I asked her to call the therapist I was seeing at the time. And very gracefully, she walked me through that, you know, because memories come back as snapshots and we went through this whole thing and I'm safe now. But talk about some of the things that you can do when you find yourself now, not in anxiety, but when you are back in that moment and you really, it feels like I'm six, I'm four, I'm 10, I'm 12, and I'm stuck. Talk to, talk to the listener about what they can do. The, th it's really important to try to stay in the present because you've gone back to the past. So one of the first things you do is you look around. What color are the walls? What color is the floor? You name five things you can see. You name five things you can hear. You keep looking for what you can see, what you can hear. Maybe you can smell something uh, and so on. And just really anything you can do to stay present. If, if it's really hard, you can you know, suck on a lemon or you know, ice cubes or listen to really loud music. I've had clients who did that, but absolutely do every possible thing you can to stay in the present and not go back there. Because in the present, you're safe. It's in the past that you were in danger. And that's a very hard distinction to make. The one thing that I, and I was very early in my healing at that time. Uh, my daughter's now almost 40 and she was still living at home. I did not have those tools and it was very frightening because I was really stuck there. I loved when you said, grab a lemon, grab an ice cube, you know, <laughs> having lived through that kind of uh, relived lived experience through PTSD. I just love that. I'd never had anybody tell me that before. And I thought, oh my gosh, sometimes today, you know, cause we can never completely rid ourselves of these things and triggers and that sort of thing. People like to think there's a Nirvana I have a real expectation yeah. that, you know, like my counselor said to me, Jody, I can't tell you that when you're 80, something wouldn't come back, you know, because we had years and years of trauma that we lived through. But it's, I, I loved actually thinking about, because I have so many tools, but I did not have the lemon or the ice cube, Russell, I have to tell you. And <laughs> sometimes, you know, I get that weird feeling like my body's going back and is going to get stuck. And I loved that. It That's just kind of a cool thing. I'm like, I'm going to use, I'm taking that forward with me in life. <laughs> Because <laughs> it'll it'll quickly go because those are really real things. I mean, they can be terrifying. You you know, people don't understand why people will all of a sudden, yeah, I, I'm a CASA worker here in Montana and I watch these children who have lived trauma and they're just, they get a trigger and they freak out and people do not mm -hmm. understand what's happening. 
And yeah. I, I can relate, right? Because it happens when you're 43, 62, you know what I mean? Like it, it just really happens. So anyway, I, I just think that your work is so outstanding. I like to give the opportunity for um, you since you took the time. I know it's late where you are. I so appreciate you being with me. I had a full work day. But this matters very much to me. And I know that um, listeners are out there and I know they're listening. What would you like to share with the viewer that's just on your heart tonight to share? I want to give back some time to you to talk about anything that we haven't. Your work is phenomenal. I think that's so cool um, that you're helping these people because it's kind of like an alcoholic needs an alcoholic to tell him how it is. I think a survivor can really reach out and share in a way that people listen to. So Russell, I'm going to just give you back the last few minutes to share anything that you'd like to share that you think we didn't touch on. Cause there's so much to talk about. Oh my goodness. Uh, gosh. Uh, we, we've, we've talked about, uh, PTSD and, um, I think one thing I would like to say about PTSD, most people, when they think about PTSD, they think, oh, that happens to people with combat experience. Well, it turns out that fewer than 1% of people with PTSD have combat experience. And, you know, that's, that's basically what you hear about in the media. Mm -hmm. The number one cause of PTSD is sexual violence. And I have had clients say to me, no, I can't have PTSD because I wasn't in the military. Right. And, you know, it, it's a misconception. And I, I think it's important to get past that. The, the biggest cause of PTSD is sexual violence. And so I see an awful lot of it in, in my practice. Um, and Again, that, right. Know, the, the stats in your book are phenomenal around that. And it is so true. When I read that, I was like, really? Because even I thought, you know, I love that the Vietnam vets actually taught us a lot about, you know, PTSD. They did because they weren't doing well when they came back. That book by uh, Judith Herman, uh, Trauma and Recovery, such a good book. But she talks about that and they taught us a lot. And we started looking at trauma and how it affected us. So I appreciate that work and that, but it, but it was so funny that again, like you say, 1%, because look at that. I mean, mm. you think about the population and the billions of people, it makes sense, but we're not seeing these stats, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a survivor of child sexual abuse, you don't really have a before exactly. to compare what happened. Uh, so, you know, these people who went to, to war, they had a before and an after, and they realized, well, things have changed. But if, if you had child sexual abuse, you don't have that. You don't realize what has happened to you. And, oh, yes, here's something that I think might be very helpful to, to people to know, is I have people frequently say to me, I overreact a lot. Mm. And what I tell them is what's happening is you're not reacting in the present. You're reacting in the past. Mm -hmm. You get triggered and you don't realize you're getting triggered because you don't have a picture of what's happening, but you feel the emotions you felt during that trauma. So something, you know, totally innocent could happen. It's like, I think I mentioned in the book, somebody had an overdraft at the bank or something. Mm -hmm. And it was just overwhelming for them <clears throat> because they thought they did something wrong. And what did that relate to? Being abused by a babysitter, they thought they did something wrong. And it, yes. it just took them right back. It does. And I, I think that's fascinating when people, it's like the missing puzzle piece. If you think there's something missing in your life, there is, <laughs> you know what I mean? These fragments that come back to people, I always tell them, start with the one fragment you have and stay with it and allow it to be authentic in your life. Because it is like what you say, um, it's remarkable. We're reacting to something we don't know. That's what you just said. And that's a very, People don't talk about that very much, right? It's these hidden agendas that are trying to be worked out in our lives that we don't understand. But there, there's this, this visceral reaction that's quite strong and it's alarming, right? But we don't know. Mm -hmm. 
what would a person do if they have that? Because I know many people have that. Like I'm overreacting. I have this. Why am I reacting in this way? Like you just mentioned when we earlier about uh, that kind of material that made you respond in a certain way. What should a person do to start exploring that? They should stop and explore it, right? Right. So what I do with my clients is, you know, if it's a, say a feeling of shame, for example, I would say, okay, think about when in your life you felt shame and when was the first time you can think of that you felt that mm, shame. I love that. And uh, another thing I'll do is I'll ask them what, what other feelings uh, they have around that, uh, you know, when, when they feel these, uh, that they're overreacting. And it's amazing how often people will say to me, you know, I, I was feeling this, but, you know, I felt small. It's like, bingo. You felt small because you were, you were back there. Mm -hmm. And that is something, I, you know, when someone says I felt small, it's like, PTSD, there you are, you're having a flashback. That, that feeling of be, being small, it's, it so often goes with that. And it's a real clue that, <clears throat> yeah, this isn't about the present. It's about when you were small. And yeah. so all I can do is invite people to think about that emotion and where it came from, because it probably came from something that happened when you were, you know, very young. Oh, it's so true. This has just been such a wonderful time chatting with you. Um, I'm going to put all of Russell's links to his book and uh, a description, obviously, in this. I'll also cut this into pieces and put it on TikTok. It's, it's quite popular out there because people are in such need of these conversations. Um, we all work so much. Russell, thank you so much for being here. You've just been I just feel so honored that you took time out just to help people and give this wonderful information because this is just such great information. I'll be in touch with you. And, and uh, I, I just thank you again so much. Is there anything else that you'd like to say? I, I think that we've just said so much. It's wonderful tonight. It was a lot oh, that we covered. A, yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Keep up that that good work. And everybody out there, you remember to see yourself this week. You see you take your eyes off the abuser and I'll see you next time. Good night.